Okay, so thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, it's, uh, you know, different conditions than what was planned, and I'm really impressed with the organizers for being able to react so quickly to the, the changing development. So it's, uh, yeah, really, um, really a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm Andy Carvel. I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we approach growth and retention at SoundCloud, and specifically uh, around mobile growth. Um, first of all, quick introduction to SoundCloud. Um, SoundCloud is a leading audio platform uh, where creators of music and audio of all types can uh, upload their creations and share them with the world. So that's podcasters, comedians, musicians, DJs, producers, anybody who has music or audio that they want to share with the world, we give them the platform to do it. Um, and uh, increasingly our, our user base is mobile. Um, we see you know, most of our growth coming from mobile apps these days, um, and so mobile growth and growth initiatives are really important to that trajectory. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our um, approach to growth at SoundCloud and the way that we structure the team. So we're headquartered in Berlin, although we do have offices in New York, San Francisco, and London. And uh, I'm working in the Berlin office um, along with most of our product team and heading up a team uh, focused on uh, user retention. <coughs> We also have teams for acquisition, activation, and international. So growth, it's, uh, it's a pretty complex topic. Um, and there's a lot of technology involved there. So a lot, lot of different technologies, a lot of different concepts to battle with. It's increasingly data-driven as, a, as a, a practice. And it can be quite a confusing space, which is what this slide is, is really kind of meant to uh, to, to illustrate that there's, that there's a lot going on and it's also very fast moving. So it can be kind of quite difficult to take stock of like everything that you might do and prioritize what might be most important. That's why I came up with this thing called the, uh, the mobile growth stack. It's basically, it's been described as a, a cheat sheet for mobile marketing. It's basically a framework that allows, um, encourages consideration of a whole range of different disciplines or different um, approaches and technologies and try to encapsulate kind of all of the key activities that are involved in growth um, in, in one framework. So I'm not going to explain the whole stack here today. It's quite, quite a, like, as you can see, there's quite a lot of detail there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'll, I'll sort of outline the, the sort of key thinking behind it. Uh, basically, as you see, there's, uh, there's three key layers here, acquisition, engagement and retention, and monetization underpinned by like a solid layer of analytics. Uh, I really do believe that analytics is the key to doing marketing these days, to really be measuring everything that you do. Um, at SoundCloud, we don't do anything unless we can measure the impact and um, hopefully optimize that impact to drive towards a better result. Um, yeah, and then back to the, the, the top layers here, uh, acquisition, engagement, and monetization being the kind of three key stages of a customer life cycle. And then down the side, we have retargeting and international, which are what I see is like kind of vertical channels, <coughs> vertical uh, uh, layers of the stack that kind of cut through these different layers of the life cycle. Uh, if you apply international strategy properly, then it will accelerate your acquisition, drive more engagement and retention, and drive more monetization in multiple countries. Um, similarly, retargeting is something that this is like finding users um, who have you know, been users and then tracking them down on, on third party networks. That can be really useful for you know, tracking down people who um, <clears throat> maybe visited your, your homepage but, but didn't sign up for an account and retargeting them to bring them back. So right at the top of the funnel. Um, bringing people back who've churned, so sort of standard reactivation, right through to abandoned cart scenarios um, and bringing people back to make more purchases. So it's, it's really like a, a multiplier right across the stack. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the, uh, the boxes in detail because I don't have time today, but you can read more at mobilegrowthstack.com. So what I am going to do is uh, call out some of the, uh, the cells from the mobile growth stack, um, which are particularly important for SoundCloud, and explain how we apply them at SoundCloud. So I'm going to give a couple of examples from acquisition, several from retention, because that's my speciality right now, um, and yeah, a little um, example of how we've, we've really managed to accelerate growth through like, strong internationalization efforts at the end. So I'll start off with cross-sell. This is um, one of our key acquisition channels for SoundCloud. Uh, we have um, <coughs> a website as well as a mobile website, uh, HTML5 mobile web, um, and we get a lot of traffic to these sites, both through our viral integrations and through SEO and search. So um, <clears throat> what we find is we have a lot of transient traffic to our web and mobile web properties, 
Um, and our challenge is really to, to get those users to, to download and, and engage with the mobile app as soon as possible. We typically have like one chance to, to convert this user who's a very transient visitor into a loyal, engaged mobile app user. We see higher engagement, higher retention, uh, more listening time, which is a key KPI for us. Uh, we see all of that like much higher on mobile apps. Um, so that's, that's really considered the destination. And we consider these other channels essentially like conduits to, to, to drive people to the app store. Uh, also by doing cross-sell well, Every, every user, that, every visitor that we effectively convert from mobile web or web over to the App Store, um, that helps us to drive us up the rankings as well. So we get more downloads, which boosts our organic visibility, which creates a positive feedback loop. So like optimizing our cross-sell links is, is very important for us. Speaking of the App Store, um, the App Store is basically the landing page for your app, whether it's um, talking about the Apple App Store, Google Play, or a third-party store. Um, so optimizing that uh, that page for conversion becomes super important. This is this is a, a conversion optimization challenge. Uh, you're also setting the right expectation for the, with the, with the user in terms of what they should expect when they actually download the app. So actually, your onboarding starts in the store too. Uh, but ultimately, if there's one objective of, of the app store, it's about driving conversion. So last year, we uh, we built our own like kind of fake app store, a copy of the app store, which we could use to A-B test. So it's basically, um, we used Optimizely to swap assets in and out. And we drove a portion of our traffic there so that we could optimize for conversion exactly this. We could swap out screenshots, um, play around with the title, play around with the description without changing our, our real store presence to see which was going to convert better, and then applying those learnings back to the store. These days, you can do that right within Google Play. Google Play has rolled out a really nice A-B testing framework, and I would really encourage you to take a, a look at that. If you want to drive more downloads to your, to your apps, run the experiments in Google Play and apply the learnings over to the uh, Apple App Store. Um, you can, uh, you can, there are also some, some nice third-party tools that can help you with this, including sp split, split metrics and uh, test nest, I believe. So still on the, uh, the subject of App Store optimization, uh, one thing which was really key for us was driving good ratings in the store. Um, and we do that with uh, a really nice in-app campaign, which serves a couple of purposes. Uh, we ask all of our new users, after a couple of sessions, um, <coughs> if the standard NPS question. So for those of you who don't know about Net Promoter Score, it's basically a question where we ask, how likely is it that you would recommend SoundCloud to a friend or colleague? Uh, and they give you a rating between 0 and 10. Um, if they give us a low rating, um, we ask the users for feedback. So in other words, what can we improve and how can we do things better? If they give us a really high rating, we say thanks very much and please rate us in the store. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, just on, on this note, this, uh, this drives a, t a ton of additional high value ratings for us that really increases our, our ratio of five star reviews in the store, uh, which has a demonstrable impact on our conversion rate. Uh, we work a lot to try to drive virality within the app. Now, an app is typically not viral unless it's that you've got a good product market fit and that users are really appreciating the app. Uh, however, if you give users the opportunity to share the app or share content within the app to their friends or colleagues, then uh, you have you know greater chance of virality occurring. Um, so we try to like build out new viral channels all the time. So we, currently we have Facebook app invites, um, which is something we're trialing. Um, we also have various shares for the content itself. But this is, this is specifically around inviting friends to the app. And this is working pretty well for us. Now, speaking about retention specifically, um, I really do believe that it's, it's critical to nail retention, particularly in the early days of, of building an, a mobile app or a product. Um, <clears throat> So this is basically how we think about retention at SoundCloud. It's really about building growth machines or loops um, which, uh, which drive ongoing activity um, and really trying to keep users, build, build habits that the users will, will, will keep coming back and keep using your app more often. And then when they fall out of those loops for whatever reason, if they churn, work on reactivating them. So we think about retention in terms of bringing on new users more effectively growing a repeat user segment, so basically turning all new users into repeat users who are coming back month on month, and shrinking the, uh, the bucket of returning users, as we call them. We, these are users who we didn't see them last month, but they, they come back again this month, and then we maybe don't see them for another couple of months. Um, so it's about sort of shrinking this casual user bucket and turning them into repeat loyal users and driving up in vis uh, visit frequency. 
How do we do that? Um, there's a bunch of ways. Uh, the example here is what we call a drip campaign. Uh, it's an in-app message campaign that we deliver. We test different, uh, different messaging, different trigger points. Um, this, is a, this is an onboarding campaign that I'm, I'm showing here. So it's basically different messages designed to help people understand how to use the app and to drive key actions, which we see as like key leading indicators of engagement uh, based on our analytics. Activity notifications is another big one. So like we're a platform, we have a lot of stuff happening on the platform that's sort of independent of the, the user interaction. So in other words, a user might follow a bunch of artists and those artists might release new content onto the platform. And those users want to know about them. So if I'm, if I'm a big uh, Britney Spears fan and Britney Spears drops a track, then um, yeah, I want to hear about it. So uh, <coughs> yeah, we, we built in the retention team a really nice activity notification service. It's still a, very much a work in progress. It's a big project. Um, but it's, it's probably one of the most uh, impactful initiatives that we can, uh, we can work on at the moment. And so we're already driving some, some really nice impact on this. We're delivering over, uh, I think, 100 million push notifications per month right now. And uh, we'll, we'll increase that more. But of course, it's very important to, uh, to also make sure that you're delivering smart, timely, and relevant communications, that you're not annoying users. Um, speaking of like how you measure the, uh, the impact of push notifications, uh, it's really important to understand that a push notification is more powerful than just the amount of people who click on the notification and open the app directly from that notification. Um, so we look at influenced opens to really understand what is the real impact of, of push. Um, so this is, um, <coughs> this is an example. It's a, it's a model um, that I think was published by Urban Airship, um, but there's various different impact attribution models that you can use. But it's essentially about establishing a baseline of activity and understanding what is the the typical user engagement in a particular time frame, and then measuring that increased engagement that happens after you send a push. And it works on sort of a time decay model. So I think it looks at 12 hours after the push was sent and to see if the, an app was opened like with more regularity than it would have been normally. Um, and from that, you can sort of project or, or, or infer, infer the, uh, the real impact of your push campaign. Deep linking is also something which is uh, super important for retention. So when a user already has the app installed and they land on one of our other properties, perhaps through a search link or a viral link from an integration with, with Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr, um, they'll land on our mobile website. But actually, we really want to get them back into the, uh, the native app as quickly as possible. Um, for new users, of course, we want to get them over to the App Store, as previ previously explained. Um, so we have two different flows, depending on whether you're already a user or whether you are you know, somebody who we can hopefully turn into a user. So um, <clears throat> in the case of the mobile web, we have, we have a Listen on SoundCloud iOS banner here. Um, and if, you're, if you have the app installed, it'll deep link you directly into the content within the app. If you don't have the app installed, it'll take you over to the, to the App Store to, to install the app. And finally, I'd like to talk just briefly about uh, internationalization and how localizing your App Store assets can make a really big difference to your acquisition rate. Um, so these are the, the stats that we saw, month on month growth, uh, growth in installs, by the way, um, <coughs> after localizing our App Store metadata. So this is not about app localizing the whole app itself or any of the content. This is just localizing our App Store. So call to actions on the screenshots, descriptions, title, um, just localizing that stuff. These are the results we saw. So as you can see, mostly very positive. Um, with a couple of exceptions, which is uh, sort of a, a cautionary tale. We actually saw installs drop in Japan and China after we localized those, those stores, um, likely because we didn't have a really good job on the, uh, the translations. So it's uh, sort of a cautionary tale that you really have to understand the local market and uh, have someone who really understands your product doing the translations. Otherwise, you can make mistakes. So that's it for me. Um, I would normally ask the audience if there are any questions, but uh, I'm in a studio today. so. Well, there is a question, uh, though, uh, Andy, mm -hmm. um, we just received. And uh, that's about something uh, I think you can, can address today. Fantastic. What was your biggest learning the last couple of six months while using this type of, uh, of measurements? Biggest learning in six months? Yeah. Ah, OK, I would say that, um, that push notifications are incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we. We hypothesized that we could drive a lot of impact with push. Um, we were pleasantly surprised to outperform those projections. We've seen new user retention increasing 2.5% almost month on month for the last, last couple of months mm -hmm. in like absolute terms. Um, 
But I'd also say, you know, when I say powerful, that's that's also they also have the power to really annoy users. We actually saw yeah. our push opt-in rate drop quite substantially after we started testing and rolling out our activity notifications. And so we had to dial back a little bit on the, the sort of level of, you know, the, the quantity of push notifications we were sending. So, But also maybe the type or, uh, of message you were sending as a push notification. Certainly, we're also working to Im improve the, uh, the the click rate and, you know, the, which which ultimately means mm -hmm. the uh, the relevance of the messaging. That's that's super important as well. You shouldn't be bothering people with, with messages that they don't, they aren't interested in or, you know, telling them about things that they don't care about. Um, but I think even if they do care about them, they, they will still have a tolerance for like how many times they want to be told about that stuff yeah. within a period. So, so when I say they're powerful, I'd say you know, you've got to use that power responsibly and really keep an eye on the key metrics, not just the positive ones, but also things like opt-in rate, uh, because that could fall. Okay. Well, if you still have a question for him, you can send it uh, maybe later on via, via Twitter, mm -hmm. and then maybe you can respond to it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Of course. So thank you very much. Thank you.